In this part in our series on starting BigCommerce development, we're going to focus in on the BigCommerce APIs and not the nitty gritty details of individual operations and their parameters, but we're going to take a broader look because there are different categories of BigCommerce APIs that work in different ways uh, because of different contexts and different purposes. One of the hurdles when I first dived into the BigCommerce APIs was the need to kind of constantly run back to the documentation, not just for those nitty gritty details, uh, but to kind of review and remind myself on broader aspects. Uh, I would uh, be looking at doing a specific thing and wonder, oh, was this one of those operations that I need to contact the API on my own domain for, or the big commerce domain, or how did the authentication method work for this operation again? Uh, so we're going to slice the APIs in a few different ways, categorize them in a few different ways in this video to hopefully cement these concepts in your mind and give you better confidence uh, as you are working with different APIs for choosing the right ones and knowing exactly how to expect to work with those endpoints. One of the ways we can break down the BigCommerce APIs is according to the API style or request architecture, protocol, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but there are both GraphQL and REST APIs available to work with in BigCommerce. It's not exactly a situation where there's feature parity between the two and you're just choosing one or the other. Some things you can only do with one API style or the other. Some things you can do with either one and some things you can do with either one but do in slightly different ways. Uh, but naturally the GraphQL APIs have mostly been focused on providing client-side operations in a very performant way. Uh, so as those have been expanding, that's been the focus on the available GraphQL APIs. And these have been getting uh, the, most, uh, the most rapid attention uh, for continuing to expand their coverage. At this point, with the release of the beta versions of GraphQL for cart and checkout operations, you pretty much have availability of uh, being able to do all of the front-end shopping experience operations all the way from display and catalog data through checkout with GraphQL APIs. On the other hand, the REST APIs have the widest current coverage, and obviously there, there's coverage there for not only fetching data from your big commerce store, but also managing virtually any aspect of that data. A couple of the APIs that don't necessarily fall either into the GraphQL or REST category, although I guess you could technically call them REST endpoints, are the current customer API and the customer login API, which are both get endpoints that involve sending uh, some specific query string parameters or dealing with tokens or the customer's session data. Now let's talk about APIs from the standpoint of functionality, what they can actually do. What are the different categories or areas of the big commerce APIs according to the operations they can actually perform? The first category we'll talk about here is storefront interactions. So the operations that are critical to the full customer experience in the actual storefront. These can often be the trickiest API endpoints to deal with, and there's overlap here in the coverage between GraphQL and REST. Uh, so I'm going to divide this into three different categories, the first one being store content, meaning the fetching of catalog data, page data, etc., that you uh, that you need to drive what a customer is seeing in your storefront. There's wide coverage for this in the GraphQL storefront API. As far as REST is concerned, uh, you would simply use the fetch, uh, the, the fetch or get endpoints in the management APIs that we'll be talking about next uh, as far as getting storefront content with REST. Now, when it comes to customer login and registration, uh, there are a few different techniques here and different coverage in GraphQL and REST. For the creation of a new customer record, you're going to have to rely on a REST endpoint for that. Uh, but when it comes to logging in an existing customer, there is, uh, there's GraphQL mutations available for that, which is probably what you're going to use for a headless storefront context. Uh, but then there's also the, the two APIs we briefly talked about, the current customer API and the customer login API that are alternative methods for managing a customer session, which is probably going to be your go-to tool uh, when, you're, when your storefront needs to be interacting with uh, an external web application. Then of course we have manipulating and reading cart and checkout data. This is the primary purpose for a lot of the endpoints in the REST storefront API, which kind of works in its own way. 
Uh, and then, like I mentioned uh, just very recently, there's been uh, there's been endpoints or mutations and queries released for cart and checkout data for GraphQL as well, uh, so that you can uh, take care of the the full process of adding items to the cart. Uh, querying the data about the cart uh, with GraphQL in addition to REST. Now when we get beyond storefront interactions and into the meat and potatoes of simple API operations for managing your core data in your big commerce store, uh, this is all going to be REST endpoints uh, for management like this. And I've got things divided into a few different categories here. The catalog API is used for managing your products, categories, and brands. We have the theme and content API for managing your web pages, widgets, and widget placements and your themes configuration. The webhooks API is available for registering webhooks that will be called in response to different big commerce events. And then I've, I've simply put everything else under the management API here uh, because there's far more to manage about your big commerce store that doesn't fall easily into these other categories from managing customers and orders to your channels, pricing, shipping methods, tax rates, and all kinds of things like that. Now, it's possibly overstating things to even be dividing them into these different categories like I've presented them, because essentially all of the, the REST endpoints in this category of data management function the same way with the same endpoint, the same authentication method and everything. And in fact, in some places in the documentation, there's this distinction between those different categories we looked at, and in some places there's not. As we continue to explore the different areas of the APIs, there are a couple here that just don't easily fit into the other categories, and those include the REST Payments API, which is used to initiate secure payment processing with BigCommerce, and then there's the GraphQL Account API. So this one is a fairly recent GraphQL edition, and the only current GraphQL API that's not focused on storefront data or storefront interactions, uh, but is for managing account level users and uh, fetching information from the account level rather than the specific big commerce store level and this is also a case where there actually is not an equivalent rest api for those same kinds of operations and finally we have a couple of apis that really are quite different than the ones we've discussed so far uh, because the direction of data is different here and that's the provider apis the shipping provider api and the tax provider api uh, you can register a big commerce app as a provider of shipping rates or tax tax rates. And in this case, we're not really talking about APIs that BigCommerce implements because uh, the direction of data is flipped here. BigCommerce is actually reaching out to your app uh, to get shipping methods and shipping rates or get to get tax rates. And so this is less uh, an API that is implemented and more uh, a schema that your app must implement in order for BigCommerce to be able to interact with it. As will become increasingly clear here as we continue this discussion, one of the major distinctions between the different big commerce APIs and the way that they work has to do with whether those requests are intended to occur in a client side context uh, where a customer's session matters or whether they are more in a server to server context. There's different strategies for those two different contexts. And one of the things that affects is the endpoint that you're actually reaching out to for a given API. Uh, so for certain APIs, the REST storefront API, the GraphQL storefront API, customer login API, the current customer API, basically anything where the customer's session with your store actually matters, those are reached on an endpoint at your store's actual domain uh, because the because that's critical to the way they work that the customer's session cookie for instance be read or manipulated in those requests so those those requests are going to go to your own store's domain whereas everything else goes to this uh, consistent api.bigcommerce.com domain and your store information the hash for your store is actually just a segment in the url path for those requests now let's talk about the different authentication methods that are used for different big commerce APIs. And you're going to see that that distinction we've talked about on the context of an API request, whether it comes from the client side and a user's browser context or server to server, plays a large part in the authentication strategy that is used in different instances. Let's start with a strategy that simply has to do with where a request comes from. So the REST storefront API, which is mainly focused on managing a user's cart is expected to occur in uh, client-side 
uh, context in a user's browser, and there's actually no token involved in the REST storefront API or anything like that. This is simply a same origin restriction, where as long as the request comes from the same origin, from the same domain as the uh, as in the request path, uh, then that is going to succeed. So again, this API is, is going to be reached on your own store's domain. So if I am making an API call to mystore.com, all that's required is that the origin for that request is also mystore.com. Proceeding on from there, the simplest authentication method to talk about is authentication with long-lived stable OAuth tokens. So we're talking about authentication with a custom header in the request with tokens that are really meant to be used in server-to-server -server context where that token is kept secure and is not exposed in some way in a client context. Uh, so all of those REST management APIs we've talked about use this kind of authentication. The GraphQL uh, account API also uses this. And generally speaking, these kinds of tokens are going to be created in one of two ways. In your BigCommerce store admin, you have the ability to manually create store level API accounts and choose what permissions they have. And the result of that is going to give you a token which you can then copy and share with whatever applications need to use it. But then we have app level accounts uh, that are the same kind of token, but the way they're generated is different. They're generated with the OAuth workflow that happens when a single click app is installed. So when a store owner uh, installs an app, say from the big commerce marketplace, they choose the permissions that app is going to have. And then it's an OAuth workflow that happens between the, the user's session there in the big commerce admin and endpoints in that web application that ends up authenticating the application and big commerce and, and transmitting a token that that app can then store and use. And most API operations can use either one of these tokens, although in a few cases, only one or the other will work. The third one that we have here is an account level API account. This is specifically for the GraphQL account API, and it's generated manually the same way as a store level account, but uh, we're simply talking about in your account control panel rather than in the admin of your big commerce store. That's the kind of token that you use uh, with the GraphQL account API specifically. Then we have the APIs that are authenticated using short-lived expiring tokens where things get a little more complicated. And again, this is usually driven by contexts where these tokens are going to be exposed in a client side context, a situation where we just can't securely use those stable long-term tokens. This is the primary mechanism used to authenticate the GraphQL storefront API. That usually is generated in one of two ways. Either if you are using the default BigCommerce front end with a stencil theme, there's a pre-generated token already available to your stencil theme, either for GraphQL requests in the front matter of your templates or to pass along to JavaScript to use on the client side, or your the back end of your application is simply going to make a REST request to obtain a token that can then be used for GraphQL requests. Either way, that token is generated with the context of the particular customer so that data being fetched like catalog data and pricing and things like that uh, have that particular customer's context in mind. I should mention just to make sure there's no confusion that this is more or less the same situation, the same context as the REST storefront API. In that case, we saw that the only authentication mechanism was same origin with no specific token. In this case, an expiring token is used, but that's not really for any core architectural reason. Either one is a valid authentication strategy, and in this case, one uses one and one uses the other. The third mechanism for obtaining a token that you see in my list here for GraphQL, customer impersonation token, that's a little bit of a different case. It's a token like the second bullet point here, one you use a REST endpoint to obtain, but instead of just relying on the customer's own session uh, for, for providing the customer's context for the returned data, this token is obtained uh, with specific customer information in the request. So uh, this, is, this is really a stateless token request that gets a token that has a specific customer's context so when those when GraphQL requests are used with that token, uh, the resulting data has that customer's context. Uh, so as such, 
in the list of short-lived tokens, this is one that really isn't intended for exposure in a client context, but really is intended to be obtained and used in a backend server-to-server -server context. And then finally, in addition to GraphQL, we have the Payments API, which uses a similar expiring token, one you also have to obtain uh, with a REST request uh, that in this case is a single-use payment access token uh, that can only be used one time and then it's done. Then we have our most complicated scenario, which is the use of encrypted or signed JSON web tokens, or JWTs. Now, strictly speaking, I believe the short-lived tokens that we've talked about are JWTs, uh, but what we're talking about now is going to another level, because rather than just being a token that is used for one-way authentication, we're talking about an authentication mechanism that involves data being encrypted into the token that is then decrypted on the other side. And this is the mechanism used for two different APIs. APIs, the customer login API and the current customer API. There's also an encrypted JWT payload involved in the OAuth workflow when uh, single click apps are installed, but that's kind of just not our focus with what we're looking at. Uh, in this video, we're looking at uh, the APIs you work directly with. Uh, so in both of these cases, you have a, an app that's actually registered in the BigCommerce developer portal and has been given a client secret because that's key to the encryption mechanism here. In the first case, the customer login API, this is used for single sign on kind of apps uh, and scenarios where the authentication that needs to happen here is big commerce knowing yes this is an app that has permission to log in on behalf of this customer so the the app makes a request on behalf of the customer encrypting the customer's details with its client secret into the JWT and then big commerce is able to use that client secret to decrypt the information and verify that this was sent by that app the current customer API is kind of the reverse of this. In this case, it's the app that needs to authenticate that Big Commerce was actually the source of a certain response. So in this case, the app is trying to do some kind of operation on behalf of a Big Commerce customer within the app. This request occurs in the context of your storefront and has the client ID for that app. In the request, Big Commerce uses the client secret to encrypt the customer's details in the response that's sent back, which can then be sent along to the app, which can decrypt those and authenticate, yes, Big Commerce did send this information, so this customer is who they say they are. This has been quite the whirlwind tour of the Big Commerce APIs, and we've looked at them in several different ways. I hope this hasn't left your head spinning even more, but the goal here is just to kind of provide broad information on the way the context and purpose of different API calls determines the different categorizations and the different techniques, authentication mechanisms, etc that are at play with the different APIs so that uh, when you are building a certain solution, you can more quickly recognize from the context, from what you're trying to do, how you should expect to be able to interact with the big commerce APIs. And that should just help you build your solutions more quickly and more confidently.